Good morning. It's time for us to start. If everyone will get a seat, we'll start making announcements. It's good to see everyone here this morning. It's good to see everyone fellowshipping and talking to one another. I see a few faces, I don't know your names, but it's, it's good to have visitors here at the Tanner Church, and we're, we're, we want to welcome you here, and uh, if you'd like to stick around a little bit, we'd like to get to know you and talk to you. We have a few announcements about our uh, sick and our prayer list. Rick Chandler is back doing radiation and chemo treatments. Johnny Malone's biopsy on his kidney was negative, no cancer, so that's good to know. Uh, Gene Owens, that's Alma's brother, is back in the Decatur Hospital and not doing well, and they're requesting prayers. Uh, Dorothy Adams has been in the Madison Hospital, and uh, they don't know if she's going to be released tomorrow or the next day, but uh, be praying for Dorothy Adams. I have a, a thank you card here to read. It says, thank you for all your prayers and concerns. We are so thankful for a good report. We love our church family, and that's from Johnny and Hilda Malone. And I'll put this up on the board later out in the foyer. And other announcements. Uh, the Sunday auditorium class will be looking at the heart of the matter which is a matter of the heart beginning after the completion of Ronnie's class. Uh, ladies class sign up and part of the new Sunday morning, uh, morning ladies class will be getting September 1st and a sign up list is in the back. A Wednesday auditorium class, wow, moments in the life of Jesus beginning in September 4th. That's uh, Wednesday, uh, auditorium class. And the men's class will be a book and video class discussion wild at heart meeting in the back, in the back of the uh, church building here beginning Wednesday, September 4th. The summer series uh, still continuing on, Larry Little, I, I guess everybody here knows who that is, from the Midway Church of Christ is coming our way this Wednesday. And his lesson title is Building Spiritually God's Providence. Uh, we have a guest speaker this morning. Uh, we should have an announcement on that uh, later on, introduction, but we'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Marlon and uh, Debbie Rutherford from the Hatton Church of Christ. This morning is our worship service, uh, our order of our service. Opening prayer will be Richard Chandler, our communion service will be done by Carlos. Uh, Wayne will be leading our singing, and Troy Bevins has our closing prayer. At this time, we'll have our opening prayer. Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace and thanking you so much for your love, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son that we might have the hope of eternal life abiding in us. We pray that our life's goal will be to do his will in all things to the very best of our ability so that one day we will hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thank you for the congregation of the Lord's Church that meets here. Thank you for our elders. We thank you for our deacons. Thank you for our preacher and his, his wife as they would labor among us and pray that they might have a long life. Thank you, Father, for those of our congregation who spend time to prepare themselves to teach the truth each Lord's Day and each Wednesday night. And Father, we also thank you so very much for those who grace the pews of this congregation from meeting to meeting to sing praises and to study a portion of your truth. Our Father, we 
pray especially for those who, that Zach mentioned just a few minutes ago. We pray that you might bless, bless Rick as he struggles with his health this time and taking the radiation and the chemo. We pray for all of those who might be suffering in body. We pray that you might lay a hand of comfort on each one of us. Our Father, we pray for our health care system, for our doctors and the nurses and our hospitals. And we pray, Father, for those of the military force who protects our, our borders. Father, as we worship you today, we pray that we will sing and with the spirit and with the understanding and that we'll be attentive to, to the message that will be presented to us. And Father, we ask you most of all, as we struggle in life, that you might forgive us Help us, Father, that we will strive with all of our hearts and minds and bodies to walk in the light as your Son is in the light and we have fellowship one with another in the precious blood of Jesus Christ who cleanses us from all sin, from all unrighteousness. And we ask this prayer in his name. Amen. Good morning. Our first song today will be number 134 in the songbook. We'll sing the first, second, and last of this song. <clears throat> Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith With shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith His name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hopes of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. At this time, to help prepare minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. Sing the first, second, and third of this song. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, be my Lord. 
this time we're about to <clears throat> partake of the Lord's Supper. That is <clears throat> a reminding of the sacrifice that our Savior Jesus Christ suffered in the cross of Calgary for, for sin. Please allow our minds to go back to the cross. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Father, with a lot of love and humility, appreciation, Father, for the great sacrifice that was made for each and every one of us that through the sacrifices that your son endured in the cross of Calgary, Father, we have the promises of salvation. We ask you, Father, at this time that you bless this bread that is represented on this element this morning that remind us of the suffering that your son endured in the cross. And meanwhile, Father, we also remind you of the love and the profound love that you fell for humanity so that through your son, each and every one of us can have the opportunity of salvation. Please bless this bread and bless each person that is going to partake of this bread and allow us to examine ourselves, Father, and always be mindful of the greatness and what it all means to each and every one of us. In Christ's name we ask you these things. Amen. Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we ask you to allow each and every one of us, Father, that have made a compromise with you, that have been baptized, Father, and that we make a commitment, Father, each and every day that we partake of this fruit of the vine, Father, that allows to recognize, Father, that this is not anything, that this is a special time and a special moment, and it has a special meaning to each and every one of us that believe in your plan of salvation. We ask you, Father, to bless this fruit of the vine and allow each and every one of us to understand the love that is represented through this fruit of the vine. Through Christ's name we ask you these things. Amen. Let us ask the blessings for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the so many blessings that you bestow each and every day on us for the shelter and the upkeep, Father, that you give us each and every day. Thank you for the country that we live in and the abundance of richness that does exist. We ask you, Father, that each and every one of us, Father, contribute to the church as we have decided, Father, so that the church is able to pay its obligation publicly and privately. We ask you that each and every one of us that are going to participate, we do this, Father, in a joyful way, with joyful heart. And we also ask, Father, your blessings upon the elders that manage this offering that are done, Father, in a way that will be in accordance with your will. Forgive us, Father, for our shortcoming. Be with us always. Through Christ's name we ask you these things. Amen. I'm kind of struck after the class we had this morning at how appropriate this song here would be. We definitely are so blessed to be where we are today, to living where we are, to live where we live, and to 
to have what we have. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing this song. We'll sing the first, second, and last of this song. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God For the le- our lesson this morning, I'm going to sing a fairly new song, a song that attests to our faith in God and what he can do and will always do. One 
I hope it's okay. I'm going to stand there here among y'all. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm just a old farm guy from Lawrence County, Alabama, and I think some of y'all, uh, I've talked before we started. Brother, uh, Brother Richard Chandler, uh, he was a preacher at Hatton in the 60s, and I can remember that. I was just a young man, but he was a preacher there, and hit, uh, hit my mother and father thought a lot of him, and of course my mom's still alive, and she still remembers Brother Richard. I think the world of uh, Mark Little, I, I'm thankful he's working with you people here at, at Tanner. Uh, great family, great, great preacher of the gospel, and I know y'all grateful and thankful to have him. I want to say, did everyone get a copy of the little card? If you didn't, there's a brother in the back said he would pass them out. This is not something we're going to use primarily in the whole lesson, but if you don't have a copy, just... Uh, is there maybe someone might help pass those out? Would you do that, brother? The ones that maybe don't have them, just give out. And if you want more than one, you're welcome to have that too. But today, you know, I, I want to say before I begin, we uh, had a great opportunity during the Bible class to talk about the Lord's work going on in, in places that you all support. And, uh, and again, the Lord's work in Tanner, the Lord's work in, in Russia, uh, the Lord's work that, that's going on even in the Ukraine. So I had an opportunity to share some of those thoughts with you today, and I want to thank you again from those people. Uh, we just need to remember, keep reminding ourselves it's the Lord's work. If you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, we're going to start there in just a minute. But uh, I did want to say, you know, I hope this lesson today is something that motivates you. That, that's the purpose of it. It, it. Really, I guess it's just a, you know, if you want to call it a title, is there one job. It really is not one of those one, two, three point lessons, so it's, it's kind of like here we go, you know. So I hope, I hope when you get, we get done today <clears throat> that you're motivated to think about one person. One person that you know that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the purpose of this lesson today, and I hope it motivates you to be thinking about that person as we go through this lesson today. You know, we see these signs everywhere now, don't we? You know, you know right after COVID, it, it was really everywhere. You know, I, I still run a small business, you know, a little bit, it's almost on the, on the down climb, but anybody that's been involved in employing people or trying to employ people, or if you go to Walmart, everywhere you go, there's a help wanted sign, isn't it? It, it? We see these everywhere. Well, I want to talk to you just a little bit today about the one job that we all need to be signed up for as members of the Lord's church. And I hope this is an encouragement to you as we go. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to start here. And you know, as we start in Matthew 4, we won't read all this, but we're going to start in verse 18 in just a minute. But you know, in the beginning of this, uh, we see where Jesus Christ had gone through all these temptations. The devil came to him. He tempted him in so, all these different ways. And Jesus kept saying, it is written. 
It is written. You know, thank God for the written word that we have today that we can follow and obey it. And so then you go on down in verse 17 of, of Matthew chapter 4, and the scripture says that Jesus began to preach, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what's the kingdom? The kingdom's the Lord's church. If we believe Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus Christ said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he told Peter, said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And we all know that the kingdom was established on Acts chapter 2. And so today we're going to talk about a little bit of this recruitment. You know, today the Lord, even in Matthew chapter 4 here, let's read these passages together, verse 18 through 23. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. They were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship, with Zebedee their father mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately, get that word, I'm using the old King James. I hope that's okay with most of y'all, that's just what I grew up with. They immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And notice what happened in verse 23. The Bible says, Jesus went about all of Galilee teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was talking about the coming of the church. That's what Jesus Christ was all about Why he, he was here on the face of the earth. He was all about recruiting people to be fishers of men. And y'all, is the Lord's church. If there ever was a need for help wanted, it's in the Lord's church today. It's absolutely a necessity that we get involved if we're not. And I hope this doesn't come across in a bad way, but I'm telling you, if there ever was an opportunity, we all know these people. You know, it's kind of like that urgent plead in Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> we know this was the Ethiopian eunuch. And we get down to verse, these are scriptures we all know. We're just going to allude to them. But you know, when you got down to Acts uh, 8 verse number 30 there, what did Philip say to the, or the eunuch say to uh, uh, Philip? He, Philip told him, he said, do you understand what you're reading? Y'all, I'm telling you, we got friends and family, a lot of them, that don't understand what they're reading. If there ever was a time, let me say that again, if there ever was a time in the Lord's church that people need help understanding what they're reading is today. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 35, he preached to them to Jesus Christ. Y'all, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about the Lord's church. That's what it's all about. You know, we talked about there uh, in, the, in the Bible study time about the need for people wanting to hear the gospel. You know, everybody ought to have one chance. You know, the, the Macedonian call in Acts chapter verse, uh, 16, verses 9 through 10, there stood a man in Macedonia, and he prayed, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And what did Paul do? Did he just wait around? No, the scripture says immediately. He endeavored to go, gathering that the Lord had called us to do what? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Y'all, that urgent plead still today. You know, these little people, I call them these little people, they all know the story of Zacchaeus. Let's go to Acts, uh, Luke chapter 19 just for a few minutes. But you know, <clears throat> in Luke chapter 19, we find a great example of the heart of Jesus Christ about the loss of the world. And let's just read this passage together. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19. And Jesus entered and pressed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. You know, we sing that song, the little people, a wee little man was he. I know I've got a, <clears throat> my oldest daughter, Tatiana, and my, my other daughter, Katya, uh, my youngest daughter, but when they were little, they'd always want to sing that song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Y'all know that little song. And what a touching little song that is. But, you know, we'd always get to that. He says, Zacchaeus, I want to go to your house to eat. And we'd add hamburgers. You know, we'd just kind of make a little cute out of it. But they remember that as growing up children. But you know, let's just read this together. So Jesus passed through Jericho, <clears throat> and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was and could not for the press, because he was a man of little stature. And he ran before and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him. 
for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide in thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured among him that he was gone to, to the guests with a man that is a sinner. Just remember that. He went to be a guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto him, Lord, Lord, the half of my goods I have given to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man, my false accusation I restore unto him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This is the day salvation has come to your house. For as much as he also is the son of Abraham. Get verse 10. For the son of man is come to seek and save those which were lost. You know, you know the tax collector was not a, a very, uh, uh, somebody that really liked a whole lot. You know, don't raise your hand, but how many of us like the IRS? <laughs> you know, that's just not something we not, most people not high on those people. We try our best to pay our taxes, but you know, if they, they send you one of those little letters, it makes you a little nervous. So can you imagine Zacchaeus being this type of person? The Bible says in verse number three, he sought Jesus Christ. Y'all, I'm telling you, there's people today that are seeking Jesus Christ, and our one job is to take him to them. That's our one job. We need to be about his business. The Bible says he, he climbed up in a sycamore tree. He was really looking for Jesus. You know, sometimes we think, well, maybe not. But notice what in verse number five, the scripture says, Jesus called him by name. It's something about a name. You know, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says that every knee by the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's something about the name. Acts 4, 12, the apostle Luke writes these words, Neither is there salvation in any other name, but there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And y'all, probably the most important thing, <clears throat> there's coming a judgment. We won't read this passage, but when you get to Revelation chapter 20, there's the great judgment scene. And what does the Bible say there? Verse 15, For those whose name was not written where? In the book of life. Y'all, it's something about having your name written in the book of life. Jesus Christ saw the need to call him by name. You know, the Bible goes on to say there that he was joyful that Jesus had come to his house. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus Christ said what? I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Y'all, it should be a joyful thing to be a part of the Lord's church. You know, it says, the Bible says the crowd complained have you, ever, <clears throat> have you ever gone or thought about going? Don't, don't raise your hand on this. But, but I know sometimes even in, in what we call prison ministry or mission work, a lot of people say, why on earth are you doing that? I hope and pray that's never been said here. A lot of people say, why are you giving those people one chance? Why? Or why are you going to a country that really hates us? Why are you being a part of that work? Or why are you going to this person down the street? Don't you know that that's the most, the most profile Worst person in our community? Jesus didn't look at it that way, did he? Romans 3.23, for all have what? All have sinned and come short of the glory. Man, you looking at, you know, Apostle Paul said he was the chief of sinners. I think I can get in that line. You know, we've all had sin. We've all messed up. We've all done things that we, we're ashamed of. But Jesus Christ, you know, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, they said, you will call his name Jesus, for he shall, what? Save his people from their sins. You know, he was a penitent person. You go on to Luke, uh, I mean, verse number 8 there, the Bible says that he said, basically, he, he was repentant. But then when you get to verse number 9, he says, salvation has come to your house. You know, we mentioned that earlier. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Behold, today is the day of salvation. How many of us remember the day you obeyed the gospel? Don't raise your hand. Was that a joyful day for you? It ought to have been a joyful day. I shared a few pictures, and for some of those that were not here, I'm going to share this right quick. This is one of those <clears throat> Ukrainian refugee ladies. Her name's Valentina. She had been 
removed or had to abandon her home in the eastern part of Ukraine. She was able to make it to Warsaw, Poland. I showed those pictures earlier. She was able to make it to Warsaw, Poland. And as a result of her making it to Warsaw, Poland, the Lord allowed us to cross paths and she obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We had an opportunity in a place where we were staying there to just use the swimming pool. But y'all, there's been many of those people that's lost everything physically they've had in the country of Ukraine that now has the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. Thank you for your continued support of the Lord's work. It's about sharing the gospel with people. And so what a joy that is. I hope you remember that day. If you don't, you need to go back and remind yourself. Today as Christians, we need to remind ourselves what a joyful thing it is to be a Christian. The greatest thing in the world is to be a member of the Lord's church. That's the greatest thing. The song the brother sung, count you many blessings. That's exactly where we are in the Lord's church. Well, we continue on here in Luke chapter 19. Jesus' one goal was to do what? Seek and save the lost. You know, Jesus didn't come to the earth with a bucket list. You know, I, I guess I grew up on a farm over in Lawrence County, and I never, growing up, I, my parents never said nothing about a bucket list. A lot of these young people, they got bucket lists now. You know, I, I've, I've talked to people say, well, they got 30 things on their bucket list. Y'all, some of y'all know what a bucket list is, I guess, you know. But Jesus Christ didn't come with a bucket list. He had one job. One goal <clears throat> it was to help people obey the gospel. My oldest daughter, Tatiana, she was real athletic in school. and She was real, you know, y'all know, I'm sure a lot of these young people here, you, you, you know how they get real involved in it. And we won't get into this Auburn, Alabama thing. <clears throat> Be careful with this one. But how many football games have y'all known just lately that was either lost or won by a field goal? Don't raise your hand. And Tatiana looks at us. She says to this field goal kicker through the television screen, you got one job. <laughs> one job. And I thought, as Christians, y'all really, we got one job. You know, we go around this room <clears throat> We could probably ask every person in this room, what is your occupation? Maybe some of you are retired. But what was your occupation? Well, all of us could probably, we could make a list. I'm sure in a room this, this size of people, there'd be people with various occupations. We're talking about our one job today. No matter what your occupation is, we got one job. You know, Paul said it like this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which I am chief. You know, <clears throat> right before the Lord's church was established, we all know this passage, but in Acts chapter 8, I mean Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Well, I'm going to tell you something. In modern time, Jerusalem's Tanner, Alabama. You understand what I'm saying? You shall be witnesses. So I guess the question is, 10 coming here, how are we doing now in Tanner, Alabama? How are we doing? We are blessed people. We sung the song. Such a blessing. And then there's other places throughout the world that we shared earlier in the class. But keep thinking about it. Be thinking about that one person. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something. And this is sad to say, but we're living in a time that correction is something you can't really do publicly. I'll be careful with that. Most people don't think they're lost. The truth is, we as Christians sometimes, we don't like to talk about people needing to be saved. Let's just be honest about it. It's hard to look at somebody and say, well, you know, have you ever thought about you might be lost? Most Christians don't like the idea of telling other people they need saving. It sounds too negative. It sounds too judgmental. Don't raise your hand. But we all know, we probably most of us have been in that situation. We got family and friends that's sitting here we know has a, is not on this road. Following the words of Jesus Christ. Today there's a great urgency. The Great Commission has been diminished a little bit. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, we all can quote this. Jesus Christ said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach what? All nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I'll be with you always to the end of the world. Y'all, I'm telling you, when Jesus Christ gave that great commission to those apostles, they got after it. They got after it. They didn't wait around. You know, there, there's a, I'm going to say this, and I hope, it, I hope it's not here, and I, I don't believe it is, <clears throat> just because I know the people, some of the people, good brethren, it's here. But the casual approach to the gospel will never save the world. The casual approach to the gospel will never save the world. And I'm afraid that's being taught even in some of our pulpits now. Well, just casually as you can go, you can teach people. There's nothing wrong with casually teaching people when you got your work clothes on casually. But we need to be thinking about people. Are they saved or are they lost? In first Corinthians, in the first the first century church did what? Colossians chapter one verse twenty three. The Bible says the whole world heard what the gospel. Y'all, we got airplanes now. We got the internet. We got these smartphones. How, how, how are we looking? If we had a mirror and was looking at herself, how are we doing with this? Sharing the gospel. What does the gospel mean to us today? It should not mean just a casually going about our lives, but it should be an intentionally, deliberately, it should worry us, y'all, to the point that we can't do nothing about it but to try to help people. I firmly believe if all of us left here today with that one person on our mind, wouldn't it be great if you come back here a couple years from now and this building had to double this amount of people? Wow. Jesus never suggested that the nations would be discipled if we just simply went about our normal routines of life. We need to have whatever it takes. Y'all may have seen those, and I kind of liked it. Those old t-shirts that said, get her done. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Get her done. Well, I'm telling you in the Lord's church, it's time for us to be getting it done. Getting it done as far as teaching people. We must accept the fact there are some people who will never hear the gospel unless we take it to them. And I'm not saying per se the ones to get on an airplane and go to other places. Many can't do that. But there's some people here. There's some people in Tanner, Alabama, I'm sure, that's never heard the gospel. I want you to go to Acts chapter... To open your Bible to Acts. We're going to walk through this pretty quick. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 2, we know all these passages. We won't read them all. But, you know, in Acts chapter 2, can you just imagine being there in Jerusalem? First century. Just try to take your mind there. Here we are in Jerusalem, first century. You get to Acts chapter 2, Peter, Peter preached. The Bible says he gets to verse 36. Those people were pricked in their heart. The Bible says they were told to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in verse 38. Verse 41, the scripture says what? 3,000 people were baptized. We get to verse 47, what happened? The Lord added them to the church. I'm telling you, that was an exciting day. 3,000 people. I, I, like I said in the class earlier, I hope I don't forget it, but when the Lord allowed us to be a part of the work in Sick to Car in 1991, when there was 95 people baptized in a bathtub to establish the Lord's church in that, in that city, I hope I never forget that was an exciting day. Now I'm telling you can, you, can you remember the day you were baptized? What an excitement you had. Well, that's what was going on in that first century church, a lot of excitement. Then you get to verse number, chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible says the number grew to 5,000. Then you go on to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. What was happening in Acts chapter 5? They had, in, they had imprisoned the apostles. And look at here in verse number 29 of Acts chapter 5. And the scripture says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. They tried to shut them up. So, said, like, hey, quit talking about this Jesus. We're we, we going to keep putting you in prison. We're going to keep beating you. What happened in verse 40 and 42? 40 through 42. And to him they, are, they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beat them. Get that. <laughs> we must obey God rather than man. But when they beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus Christ and let them go. And when they departed from the presence of the council, get this, 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And daily in the temple and every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus. See, they didn't quit. You know, you get to Acts chapter 6. Just walking through Acts real quick. You get to verse number 7. Talked about the Grecian widows. It said the, 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 the crowd multiplied greatly. See, the Lord's church was on fire during the first century. Then you get to Acts chapter 7. Stuff starts rumbling a little bit. Stuff starts rumbling a little bit. What happens? Here we find Stephen. Stephen was sitting here. He, he doesn't call these people some stiff necks. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You look up somebody. You think he was ashamed to tell people they were lost? Absolutely not. Because when you get to verse 54, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. And being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Y'all, I'm telling you, this is the only time in Scripture that I've ever found that the Bible says Jesus Christ was standing. The Bible says He sat down at the throne of God when He ascended, right? But here we find a passage that says Jesus, He looked up and saw, Stephen saw Jesus Christ standing. Why do you think Jesus Christ probably stood up for Him? Because He was giving His allegiance to the fact that Stephen, you made it, brother. Is that not the truth? He was basically, I, I don't want to add here, but can't you just imagine Jesus giving Him, hey, come on, you're finishing this thing. And that's exactly what happened. You go on down and it talks about uh, then, 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 just for time's sake, I know I'm going here. But you know, here's the thing. There's a lot of danger then. Can you just imagine they stoned Stephen? Here we are still in Jerusalem. Man, it's dangerous to be a Christian. You ever even thought about that here? Maybe things are taking a turn for worse. Maybe we need to move our families, go somewhere else, like these Ukrainians. They had to relocate. This Saul guy, he's putting people in prison. He's going from house to house getting people. House to house. Did they go underground? What did they do? Just blend back into the crowd? Let me tell you what these people did. Let's just read verses 1 through 4 of Acts 8. <clears throat> and Saul was consenting unto the death. This was Stephen. At the time where there was great persecution among the church, which was at Jerusalem, they were that were scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great, great lamentation over him. For Saul, this guy going house to house, had made havoc of the church, entering in every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. But notice what these people did in verse 4. They didn't quit. And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. I shared this story of this young man during the Bible class, but I'm going to just share it just briefly to those that wasn't here. This man in 2014 was in the church building in Gorlovka, Ukraine, when the Russian separatist army walked in and stuck machine guns into his face and all the Christians in there. Told them, you're an illegal organization. We're going to take your building. Not only are we going to take your building, they knocked the windows out of the church building, stowed the Bibles in the streets, and said, for every one you pick up, we're going to kill you. That'd be enough to make you want to quit, wouldn't it? <clears throat> what did that young man do? He said, I'm going to go somewhere where the Lord's church don't exist, and I'm going to establish another congregation. That's exactly what they did in Lviv, Ukraine. Y'all, it's about not quitting. I'm going to tell you, you know, in, 19, in 2020, don't, don't raise your hand, but you know, COVID was a big, was terrible for a lot of people. It, it, it really hurt the Lord's church for his attendance, a lot of things. I remember laying in a hospital bed in UAB, UAB not for sure if I was going to make it. This was in 2020. And I kept telling I kept telling myself, Lord, I, I'm going to make these little cards one day. And so I may not get a chance to sit down with somebody and have a one-on-one -on -one Bible study with them, but I'm going to make a little card. At least they can hear what the gospel is on a simple little card. Yeah, this may be something you've got to take your phone and blow it up a little bit, but these are just some passages. 
You know, the gospel, you know, we all, I want you to think this little car and just think about this. Who's the one person that you know that needs to hear the gospel? That's the purpose of this card today. You know, the gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus, Apostle Paul said that Jesus Christ, you're saved by the gospel. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're obedient to the gospel, Romans chapter 6. We're, we're buried with him in baptism. We reenact that death, burial, and resurrection. So that's what this card's about just for time. But think about one person. Until we are compelled today to realize that people are lost, what are we really going to do about it? Here's the question. How do you look at people? Do you look at people as big people? Do we look at people as rich people? Do we look at people as poor people? Do we look at people as uh, small people, tall people? Whatever color they are. Paul said these words, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of God and give an account of ourselves, whether it be good or bad. And what does he say in verse number 11? Knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. There's going to come in a judgment. You know, 2, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. Paul was talking to the young man, Timothy, and he was trying to encourage him. You know, he talked about the faith that was in his grandmother and his mother. And he gets to verse number 7. He says, God hath not given us a spirit of fear. Are we afraid today? Are we afraid today to share the gospel? Y'all, there's really only two cops. There's only two people. We're getting close to the end. Either those that have been saved and had their sins washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, Acts 22 and Revelation 1, or those that eternally lost. Y'all, Jesus' one job was to seek and save the lost. You know, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, the Apostle Paul said it, said it like this. Take heed to the doctrine. Two things are going to happen if you take heed to the doctrine. You're going to do what? Save yourself and those that hear you. You know, the fields are white unto harvest, as Matthew teaches us in John chapter 4. Jesus said, you know, you know, that's one thing about coming to Tanner. Tanner's like Hatton, a bunch of farmland. We, we understand farming. I think most of you probably do. It's planting and it's harvesting. We've we got to keep doing that in the Lord's church. As we close this, we, we must re, re, really look at our responsibility. You know, most people in 2 Timothy chapter 4... <clears throat> For Apostle Paul was encouraging the young man, Timothy. He said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Most people hear that quoted in that passage. A lot of times, even at people's funeral, a lot of times you'll hear verses 6 through 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Sometimes I wonder if we miss verse number 5. Go back and check me on this. But in the, right in the middle of that preach the word, I have fought a good fight, what did Paul tell Timothy? Do the work of an evangelist. Y'all, our one job is to keep evangelizing our community and other places throughout the world. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those that are lost, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. You know, Paul said it like this. He said, our light affliction. <laughs> Man, look what all he went through. Shipwrecked, beaten. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might save some. This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker of it with you. Then I guess probably one of the most powerful scriptures that he used was Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Apostle Paul... And y'all may have heard it here, but I don't know if I've ever heard too many sermons that Apostle Paul's occupation was a tent maker. That was his occupation. But his one job was what? Seeking and share, saving the lost like Jesus Christ. There may be someone here today, you know, we sing that song a lot of times, lead me to some soul today. Someone today that needs to, hear the, needs to obey the gospel. Jesus said, he that believeth and his baptized shall be saved. That's obedience to the gospel, the reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Or there may be someone here today that needs the prayers of this congregation. We'll help you any way we can as we stand and sing.
Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for Brother Marlin and his wife and the, the work that they do. I pray that you'll continue to be with them. You'll continue to bless them. I pray that we'll take what we've heard today and that we will apply it to our lives. And they will, we will seek out the ones that are lost and we will bring them to know you. Be with us as we depart. Lead, guide, and guard and direct us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>